Great, Sandra. Thanks for joining me. Thanks so, for having me. I mean, we don't know each other that well, but you've always for many years have felt like a big presence because I worked at the Ayn Rand Institute. And for many years, the first thing that would happen each morning is I'd walk into the office and there was this incredible bust of Ayn Rand. And, uh-huh. and I've seen a number of them over the years, um, most of which are atrocious. Some are, let's call it real to life. But this actually, I felt like captured her essence and so oh, it was good. just, then it was always it's doing its job. It was one of those things that like you expect to take for granted. And then you're surprised to find yourself every day walking in going, oh, okay, that I'm noticing it. Like, and it, it, it was a really good way to start the day. It just puts you in that. Oh, grand. Well, thank you for telling me that. Yeah. Mental frame. Really and so uh, I'm really interested in your work and how you, approach it but i'm curious as to how you got started because certainly you know the arts is not a standard career most of us are encouraged to go to from a young age so i'm curious just how you got started on this journey well i i uh i never planned on becoming an artist or having art as a profession um and there but there was never a time when i got started, so to speak. I mean, I I had art in my life from the time I was a kid. Um, It was always there. I grew up in a household where there was art. Um, um, My parents uh, produced art, my grandparents, my sister. Um, My father was uh, an architect and his, his office was on the property. So I got to watch him draw and uh, um, my mother did drawing. Uh, my, my paternal grandfather, who was a retired engineer, he painted. Um, my, my maternal grandmother also painted. So there was, you know, art stuff around uh, always. It was a part of life. It was a natural, normal, expected part of life. So, um, um, in terms of exposure to other artworks, uh, we, we didn't particularly go to art museums or galleries, but eventually did when I was older. Um, and, and that was just a very natural transition from art in the home to art out there in the world. And what did that look like? And, so is it mostly kind of being immersed in this world where you're seeing art and seeing people doing it that you think kind of brought you to saying, oh, maybe I'll do this as a career? Or was it your own sort of creativity and kind of playing around with it as maybe you don't want to put it as a hobby, but just as one of those things you were exploring in your life that eventually you said, oh, I could actually do this for a living? It, yes, in general. I mean, I couldn't leave it alone. I knew it would always be in my life, whether it was a hobby or whatever. But I, I intended professionally to be a journalist. Um, really? Oh, yeah. I thought that'd be a great way to make a living. I mean, I loved writing, um, traveling. I could learn stuff about the world. I mean, I just thought that that'd be perfect for me. Um, and with that in with that intent, I went to university so that I could learn about the world so that I could become a good writer. Uh, And to pay uh, for my university education, I got a job at a museum sculpting. (laughs) And of course, uh, the rest is history. I mean, I I just couldn't leave it alone. I just was drawn to it. It was so satisfying. It it, um, was appealing to me. And, and eventually I realized that I could actually uh, make money uh, selling sculptures. And once I realized that, then, then the, you know, the, the idea of becoming a journalist just faded away. So that's really interesting. So, you know, there's at least kind of two major facets to being an artist, right? One is that you have to have a certain toolkit of skill so that you can kind of take whatever vision is in your mind and bring it into reality. But the other is you actually have to have something you want to say, something you want to express. This comes up a lot. Um, you know, I work a lot with young writers and 
you know, that they struggle with both, but sometimes the second they're not even aware of, it's kind of, well, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'll have something to say, or for people who are very influenced by Ayn Rand, it's sort of like, I am going to kind of write what I'm supposed to write, you know, something that's kind of been pre-assigned. Did you find that those kind of two things grew together or did you kind of struggle to be able to put into shape what you saw inside your head? What was the sort of interaction between just your kind of ability as a sculptor and, and developing your kind of vision as an artist? Well, they developed concurrently. Um, and I never thought of it as two different things. Um, from childhood, my, my uh, goal was to describe what interested me. So I would become captured or enamored with things in the world. It wasn't being generated, you know, purely from imagination. I was very much focused. It was an extrospector. I was very much focused on things in the world. And, um, and my drawing was basically a way of it expressing what I thought of those things. Um, um, I, you know, I mean, I didn't think about this consciously, but I was stylizing my description of things. And um, of course, with, with art, I mean, you have to, to be any good at it, you have to start early, you have to put in the you know, the 10,000 hours or, you know, it's, it's years and years of, and, and you become aware that you're becoming good at it. And that it, it enables you to, of course, be better at describing and stylizing your description. Uh, so it feeds on itself and um, you, you have more um, ability to experiment and innovate, but within but within the agenda, so to speak, of description. Yeah, that makes sense to me because it's I found this as I've spent more and more time writing fiction is at the beginning, you don't have full control over what you're doing. You don't know how to judge everything. You don't know kind of how to make decisions between little details. But as you kind of gain mastery and understand, OK, if I use this kind of word here, it's going to have this impact on the reader then there's more open questions that allow you to think, what really am I trying to say? What impact am I having trying to have? What kind of shade of emotion am I? And so there's the more technical ability you have, the more you're kind of forced, forcing your mind to really get clear on what I'm trying to express. And so it seems that there's just this natural growth in interplay. Yes, and it feed, it's cyclical and it feeds on itself. Um, I, I remember um, that I would experience my uh, increasing ability in, in phases. Um, and I don't know why it was like this, but I remember um, that my drawings were getting better and then they would plateau. And I would have days where um, I thought of it as being all thumbs. I just simply couldn't draw. And um, after a few days, I could draw again. And I don't know what was going on, uh, but I remember that it was, it was a, there was, there were these quiet periods and, and I couldn't even force it. I couldn't make myself draw better. Um, and then for whatever reason, whatever was going on, it was completed. And then I, and then I was able to improve. Um, yeah, I, I had that same experience um, more when I was learning to be a professional intellectual where I would go six months and kind of feel like I was treading water and you, oh, wow. and then there would just be a, a like two or three weeks where things would just fall into place. Right. And I could look back and see, you know, it wasn't perceptual in the same way, but I could I knew very clearly, OK, I'm operating at a much higher level. And a long time ago, I read a really interesting book, and I think it was called Mastery or Something Mastery, not the Robert Green book. This is some book that didn't have a lot of practical value, but that was his main point is that all people who are learning to master a skill are, will have experiences of 
plateaus and then rapid growth. And I don't know if he had anything deep to say on why, but that was reassuring to me at the time to realize. Yeah, it wasn't just you. Yeah, yeah. Just let it happen. I'm going to feel comfortable pushing and not feeling like I'm making progress because I know that eventually things will click into place. And that that didn't seem to uh, follow my trajectory as well. Right. So now when you're kind of sitting down to work on something, what does that look like for you? Like, where are you starting with, you know, what, what is the kind of inception of a project? Oh, uh, that, that, um, it's really tough to talk about this because it sounds mystical and I don't mean it to sound mystical, obviously. Um, but it, it it, it, it arises or emerges um, from my experience, uh, from observations. It, it, um, um, I, I'll find that I, I'm, I become aware of some aspect of something, whether it's a, a feature of a human being or a, um, um, a kind of day and the way that day looks and um, it emerges, uh, I guess you could say a theme emerges, but I'm not, I'm not aiming for that. I I don't, I don't start work with the, with the thought of, oh, I'm going to create a work that embodies this theme or that theme. Um, It really does emerge for lack of a better word, naturally or organically from my experience. And at some point, something becomes important to me. And I think it has to do with the way I'm connecting things and the world is making sense from a certain perspective. And then I realize, oh, it's, I'll just take an example of human growth or the, the, the growth of an individual or or that theme of the growth of an individual becomes important. And then it becomes almost a mania where I'll, once I kind of realize that that's what I'm, I'm becoming aware of, I start looking for more evidence of that across Mm -hmm. various experiences. And then I, and then I realize that if, I started thinking metaphorically that a figure with a, with a, a of a pose and a, a, a gesture or expressiveness would uh, convey that idea. Um, and then it's, it's just a case of doing the sculpture and, and that's, that's, you know, logistics. Uh, and sometimes when I'm, when I'm on that track, uh, the th- theme will become more clear to me as I'm working. And I've had this experience of, um, and this is the case with commissions where um, I'm, I have an assignment to do a certain subject and I become devoted to the subject and kind of obsessed with it. And then I start noticing things about the subject. And then that becomes my raison d'etre. It, it, and I start emphasizing that thing, whatever that is. And then a theme emerges. Uh, and I feel like it's coming from the subject. Obviously, that's a mystical way of thinking. Of, you know, it's, it's not actually coming from the subject. It's coming from a process that I'm engaging in, in observing and thinking about the subject. It's, I could, I always marvel, and let's see if I can even put this into words. You know, at one level, it's kind of surprising that, you know, you could just have a figure that's not moving and just holding its body in a certain way and looking in a certain direction and that that expresses anything meaningful right like it's just a body and kind of in a certain shape it's just but, a guy <laughs> yeah right? but it's that, not just a yeah it's not but just that we just but that it's it, that you could bring in you know 30 different people and if you know that if you kind of walk them through it a little bit 
they would start to be able to articulate, oh, posture conveys something, right? The direction yeah. of somebody looking conveys something. Like all of those little things convey something. And I've tried to, um, I had a, a friend of mine, Luke Travers on a week or two ago. I saw that. That was a great interview. And part of what I really got from him um, besides just being able to enjoy art more broadly was, you know, if I'm writing fiction, how can I describe the way that people are holding themselves or the way that their appearance look in a way to evoke those kinds of qualities or emotions or whatnot. And so it's uh, it part of what it makes it's made me do is appreciate what you as an artist have to go through in order to create a sculpture. Cause my experience with art growing up, I was not exposed to much of it at all. It, nobody in my family was artistic and right. um, a, a little bit and of that's fairly standard. That's, that's the more common. And so experience. I took an art history class, my senior year of high school, mostly because they were going to give us a trip to France and Germany. <laughs> I wanted to go to France and Germany. Um, but even there, we weren't really taught what artists were doing. It was just, Oh, here's, you know, this right. sculpture, it was, it was more kind of just history. Like at some time somebody right. created this thing and we weren't right. really taught how to look at it and how an artist would have thought about creating it. And right. so the more I learn about that and what's going into the thing that I'm looking at, the more it just really deepens my, um, what I'm getting out of it as a viewer. Yes. And, and I think, um, I mean, it's perfectly understandable, to, um, particularly today, most people are not um, aesthetically literate. Um, and, and that's across the art forms, you know, in terms of literature, as well as painting, sculpture, and dance. Um, and uh, it, you, you shouldn't really be having to shoulder that burden as an adult you know, in, in a better culture, you would all, you would be uh, aesthetically literate and it wouldn't be this task of trying to adjust yourself to being able to, to gain uh, pleasure and fulfillment from art. Um, so uh, that you, that it can be done is wonderful. I think that Luke's uh, method is, uh, is really good. And uh, I think that his method enables uh, adults as well as young people to gain a personal experience with art. Um, having said that, um, not all art is, is um, subject to narration or a narrative or a story. And there, there's, you know, other aspects to art appreciation that don't involve that. But I think what he's doing is very important and very good. And uh, I think it's terrific that you were able to have him on uh, for an interview. Well, I think that's a good segue into the main thing I wanted to talk to you about, which is um, I have, I hope it's in camera, yeah, Windows on Humanity. So this is your new book, the subtitle, A History of How Art Reflects Our Ideas about our lives and world. And I just remember as I was reading this, I was like, this is what I wish I had had my senior oh. year. Oh, I of, wish you had it too. <laughs> you know, I wish when, I'd had it. when we were learning art history, because it has a mm -hmm. lot of the kind of just aesthetics of what, you know, the meaning of art is, but I think it touches also on these wider aspects of what art is doing, particularly if we're, you know, going to start at the beginning of art. And so, um, Maybe I'll just start with uh, however you kind of want to introduce what you were out to achieve in the book and, and what you're hoping it accomplishes. Yes, I, I um, and we've been talking about art as, as basically metaphysics, uh, but art is also an artifact. And when you think of what art is telling us about man, about, uh, and of course I mean species man, um, his soul, his, his uh, intellect, his morality, uh, those uh, important deep things are revealed by art, by visual art, um, painting and sculpture. And 
particularly with sculpture, it's showing, showing us um, man's view of himself. So these are really profound, uh, important things that, that, that art um, makes available to us. And so art of the past is making available to us what it is that human beings thought about themselves and their world. Um, it, so it's a really a, a unique artifact in that sense. I think at the outset of, of my book, I, I make the claim that, that it, it is such a unique artifact that no other artifact can, can give you that kind of information. No vehicle, no tool, no weapon, no, no building even can tell you that. And even, even the literature of the past isn't, isn't enough. Um, you can um, find uh, literature uh, in the past that doesn't really show you what people took seriously. Um, I mean, you can read about the uh, discussions that the ancient Greeks were having uh, about human capacity, but the sculptures and to some degree the paintings show you what they thought, what they actually thought was important enough to them to dramatize in some permanent medium. Um, so it's a window to man's soul in a certain sense. Yeah, I mean, this is kind of a minor thing, but just one thing that I'd never thought about, but really struck me was, you know, the, the earliest art was, you know, we, we usually associate kind of art in the past with religion. But if you get to the oldest art, it's much more kind of surrounding, you know, the central focus, which is like, how are we going to eat? How are we going to reproduce? Right. Like it's right. Um, and, and their top values. Yeah. Those were their top values. And, and I think that goes to your point about like knowing what's important to a culture because apps and art, I mean, we would really have no sense of anything about the life of these really ancient cultures where we don't have, you know, entire manuscripts and, right. and things like that. I mean, it would basically be, maybe we know what they eat and. Right. Right. And that's more, <laughs> more or less. Right. It. And if you love man, it's just, you want to know what he did and how did he, how did he grow or how did he succeed? How did he fail? What did he do? What happened? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's a general history question, but the art uh, gives you um, a, a deeper level of, of, of knowing what happened and why. Um, and and uh, when you treat uh, art as an artifact, you're, you have to know that art is not a standalone artifact, that, that it's you, you learn about it within the context of everything else that you know, if anything, about a culture. Um, but um, that said, you can learn a lot about a culture just by look, looking at the artwork without knowing anything else. And that, that's, that's a, a challenge, but your frame of reference, of course, it, when you do that, is um, reality. What do you know about the subject? What do you know about human beings? What do you know about places? Um, uh, so, I mean, we can get it more into that, uh, but um, you One can question. learn a lot about a culture just by only knowing what their art was. Now, one question. So, I mean, when, when I learned art history and uh, hopefully none of my old art history teachers will listen because I don't mean to bash them, but I do, I don't think it was a very good education, but um, the real emphasis was on sort of the technical capabilities that were acquired by human beings over time. And I do think that's an important part, right? Like it right. wasn't like, you know, in, in, in 2000 BC, they didn't produce Renaissance works just because they had a different view of life. Like there was just so much about portraying things that weren't discovered um, but how do you try to disentangle sort of the knowledge of how to express things in art from the, the nature of the culture that's being right. expressed? Right. Well, it's, it's important to know that 
um, the, capa the technical capacities of an artist are driven by the artist um, and that, it, you know, it's not, you know, Marx wasn't right. It's not that, you know, economic forces or material forces are acting on, on the artist. The artist is uh, expressing uh, something that they believe or understand. And if you look at the progression of art from in, in antiquity, from you know really primitive, strange looking figures to uh, you know the wing victory or the uh, discus or you're seeing the result of of artists pushing the technology. They're the ones that are insisting on, you know, we just aren't satisfied with the way things look. We want to make it more this way. In other words, we want a figure that that has accurate anatomy. We want the figure to convey its potential for movement. And, and so um, the technical ability of artists isn't coming from the outside. It's not coming from technical forces. It's coming from uh, a motivation with, of the artist to pursue a certain goal. And the goal is rooted in ideas, in values. That's really interesting. Yeah, I because they, I was thinking about it purely as almost this can these two disentangled tracks that were being followed, and right. you know, we just got yeah. lucky that they got really good, you know, by the time of the right. Renaissance. Versus, it's precisely what they want to express that's going to determine kind of where the technical limits of art get pushed. Right. Right. And, and a parallel is philosophy, you know, where did all, where did all this philosophy come from? Uh, well, the Greeks at the time of Thales were shifting in their orientation from simply ascribing to authority, mystic authority, and they were probing and observing and asking questions about their observations and forming conclusions and hypotheses and that's that's a whole methodological change shift over from uh, the earlier cultures of antiquity and and then lo and behold you have this emergence of philosophy that just keeps growing and uh, you know secular thought continues to grow and ends up in in the studios the art the artist studios it's a method it's a an orientation and method of thinking. That's fascinating. I, so, I mean, this is a major point, I think, of the book, but it's probably an unfamiliar point to a lot of people, the idea that, you know, art is capturing culture. And so I was hoping we could walk through an example or two. Um, oh, sure. You sent me over uh, a few that I can um, share. I don't think I've ever done a share screen on Zoom, though. So we will. Oh, cool. All right. So let me know what to pull up. Well, whatever, uh, whatever interests you. Okay, well, let's see. All right. So this one is Hero Lion. Can you tell us a little bit about that? And yeah, this then, is, uh, uh, we'll go to something that would be a good contrast. Yeah, we, I think uh, this and the Greek Lapith are good contrasts. Um, yeah. So um, on the left, and that's the left on your screen, is that mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Uh, we have uh, what's considered, what was considered to be a hero, uh, according to Assyrian culture. Um, he's uh, early eighth century uh, BC. Um, this is uh, a, a lion slayer, uh, and I think rooted in the um, in the Epic of Gilgamesh. I think that's the literary source of this type of figure. And uh, he uh, was carved. This panel was carved on the wall of a palace, um, King Sargon II, um, in the Assyrian culture and Assyrian. 
culture was pretty brutal. Uh, and they, their sense of the heroic was a, a, a frightening muscular giant. This, this panel is almost 15 feet tall. Uh, it's huge, very uh, imposing. Oh, can and, I just pause on yeah. that just as an aside? Because this, I remember reading something that you'd written, I think uh, several years ago um, about uh, Michelangelo's David. And I think you mentioned in passing that the difference between viewing something in a photo versus viewing something in person and that oh, yeah. it There's, can be very misleading. Yeah, the uh, photos can't, particularly with sculpture, photos can't really do the piece justice. Um, it's a totally different experience when you go see these uh, in, in real life at the collections. Um, at any rate, he, uh, so he, he stared down at uh, people who were going to visit the king. He was on the wall of a passageway leading to a throne room within a palace. So he, um, he might be considered a guardian figure, uh, but uh, you can see that the formula for the, for the body is, is similar to the Egyptian formula where you have the, um, the torso and the shoulders viewed frontally, but the legs are in profile, which is uh, unnatural, impossible, stance uh, and and uh, they were basing the figure on a formula that they'd been using for um, thousands of years. And uh, so he's uh, he's dramatizing what the Assyrians thought the heroic meant, which was was overarching physical might, you know, a very physicalistic um, grappling of of wild beasts and uh, the size of the lion gives you an idea of what size they thought their their hero was um probably this figure represented a spirit of the heroic um it's pretty primitive and then you'd be experiencing is like looming over you, right? Yes. And so you you know you'd be experiencing kind of like the quaking in the boots of yes. this enormous power above you. Yes, and they wanted people to feel that that sense of awe and you know terror on their on their way to visiting the king. Makes so sense. it's a vision of dominance uh, yeah. over the viewer as well as. The implication of dominance over a beast. Okay, so let's take a, a a different kind of approach to the heroic. Yes, and this is uh, from this is one of the metopes from the Parthenon. Uh, metopes were set high um, on the entablature. They were they were uh, square panels position between the triglyphs and um, on the outside of the Parthenon, the Metopes dramatized different battles. And in this particular me uh, Metopes from the, um, I believe the south face of the Parthenon, which in those uh, dramatized the mythic battle of the Lapiths uh, versus the centaurs. According to myth, the centaurs uh, misbehaved at, a, at an important uh, wedding, and uh, the Lapiths um, had to uh, gain control over their unruliness. I guess the centaurs became drunk and were poor guests, and the Lapiths um, battled uh, them and won. And in this particular, um, what's called a relief carving, bo both of these works of art are, are relief carvings, um, you see, and unfortunately, parts are missing, of course, the heads are gone, but we can see that the hero is holding the centaur with one hand, and the centaur is compromised with his arm twisted behind his back. The, the hero is, we don't get the sense that he's this, you know, physicalistic brute. 
he's this svelte, um, athletic youth that we don't, you know, we, we don't sense that he's has mystical powers or he's, he's not uh, there to intimidate the viewer. He's on display to elicit our admiration for his beauty, for his health, his fitness, his ease of command. Um, the monster is, uh, is, is, uh, does not have the upper hand. The, um, the hero does like an overlord, but, but we don't, we don't get a sense that he's, that the hero is, uh, is himself some sort of monster or robotic machine, <laughs> the way we, we feel with the uh, Gilgamesh figure. And he's, he's beautifully displayed. The, um, the cloak is being used to frame him. It has a theatrical quality to it. Um, we really just admire uh, the hero. Uh, we're given a chance to admire him. We're not being intimidated. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's funny how like both of these presumably like you're looking up in viewing them, right? But one, yes. it, you're being looked down upon, but the other, it's more emphasizing like looking up in admiration to something. It's just astonishing to me that something very similar can have a dramatically different feeling as yes. a viewer. Yes. And we relate more to the Lapith than we do with the Gilgamesh because he he's based on reality. His, his body is is familiar to us. It's not twisted in this awkward formula. Um, we sense that he's living in an open world like ours. And uh, we can, we're given a chance to cheer him on in a way that we, we can't with, with Gilgamesh. One question might be, um, you know, if we're trying to draw lessons about a culture, so take a, I think a, you know, kind of a contrary case, right? If we pulled up any particular artwork that was created in 20th century America, you know, it's a crapshoot on, does this have anything to say about the culture, just the individual artists? Now, these were in important places. Um, so that tells you something about- yeah, that's relevant. That tells you a lot. You know, where were these where were they displayed? Uh, and, and again, this is getting into uh, treating art as an artifact. And what else do you know about the culture? And with these, both were uh, in, uh, in very important locations um, uh, on display. They weren't um, put away anywhere. They were, they were you know, visible, particularly with the, the Lapith. Um, highly visible from the outside to anyone approaching the Parthenon. So we know that these were important works. Yeah, and so I take the wider lesson to be here that you know you can't take any one piece out of context if you're trying to think about it in terms of an artifact and what it expresses about culture, right? Where right. was it found? What are other artworks that we know? What are other parts of culture that we know about uh, you know, this place in this time, right? I, I assume that yes, there's a whole bunch of kinds of questions. Yeah, you certainly want to know, are these eccentric pieces and, and none of the other artworks in the culture looked like that? Um, in both these cases, these, they are good representatives of what art looked like in those cultures. Other artworks looked like these in those cultures. Um, I wonder look at a couple uh, others. Well, I just, I have to pull this up because this is, um, I told you about, I went on this trip to France and Germany my senior year before I really knew anything about art. But this was the one thing I saw, and this is at the Louvre, that, I mean, it took my breath away. Part oh, of it was man. the scale. I had seen pictures, but again, you don't, until you're there in front of it. And yeah. the way that they they have yeah. it, there's, you know, we were at the, the top of this the long hall. Yeah, with a staircase up. Yes. And there's, you know, it was uh, one of those moments where I just remember being awed into silence 
And so just, I'm, I'd love to hear anything that you can say to kind of give some context um, to this piece. Well, she, um, the subject is the Nike of, uh, she's a, a goddess of victory, uh, who according to myth would alight on the prow of victorious ships. And she's captured here as she's alighting on the prow of the Greeks um, ship. We don't, you know, this, this is a fragment. So there's a lot missing. Her head is gone, her arms, her other wing. Um, and probably she was uh, holding um, a horn, an instrument, um, you know, which according to myth, she would blow on the horn, heralding uh, the victory. And um, interestingly for us, there's a, an, an, an unnatural element in that she has a bird's wing and women don't have bird's wings, but somehow it works. It, it uh, because of the way that her body is, is, um, is recreated and the, the way that the drapery is uh, dramatizing wind uh, and movement, the wing, or in this case, she just has one, but she would have had two wings. The wings seem to dramatize something about what it is to be a human being, uh, what the uh, what a potential is for a human being. Um, so even though there's this this um, unnatural addition, uh, it it's it's very powerfully expressing uh, something about human potential. I mean, if you if you just take the wings out and just have, if you were to have her arms attached, one would hope that the arms would uh, echo the gesture of the wings. Um, if you didn't have the wings, you'd want that, that sense of flight, that openness, the, um, um, move, the action against a wind uh, and this, you know, the stirring uh, of the wind. Well, and that's what, what's striking to me is that, you know, I almost had to be reminded that, yeah, human beings don't have wings. Like it doesn't feel right. So if we contrast it to the, what, what was this? The a lape or a centaur, a centaur, uh, the lap lapith versus the uh, centaur. Yeah. I, I mean, you have the experience, not of the centaur, you know, being accentuating something about a human being, but it's a, you know, kind of semi-human creature monster, yes whereas this just feels like more it's bringing out something more specific about a a, a human yes uh, it's dramatizing something about human potential and we experience it that way because of the way the artist has treated the human figure in this and the uh the stirring of the drapery um well, I could go on with these all day, but I, I did want to ask you, hold on, I have to figure out now that I have not. Um, I will have to study. Well, this is good practice for how to do this. Yeah, I uh, do not know how to. Oh, there we go. All right, I have succeeded. Um, sorry about that. So, right. just for people who are only listening on audio, I just had to struggle to stop sharing my screen. I, I did not suddenly lose my ability to speak. Um, but so, um, I mean, writing this book, I mean, there's an enormous scope, and indeed, this uh, you know only goes up to uh, you have it prehistory to the fall of Rome. And, you know, right. 500 pages. I mean, there's so much insight and information here. Um, did you learn anything particularly new as you were trying to put this together? Because clearly this is something you've you know spent a lifetime studying. But were there any big insights as you were trying to tell the mm -hmm. story, you know, through Rome of uh, culture and art? 
something that I didn't already know. Or maybe it's just something that raised an importance in your mind. Um, I, um, not while I was writing it. I mean, by the time I was writing it, I knew the content. Um, there wasn't any, anything during the writing except perhaps, um, Uh, when I uh, found um, uh, literary samples from the periods and how how uh, accurately descriptive they were of this, the culture that that these works came from. Interestingly enough, it all fits together. <laughs> um, well, one of the things uh, I found very striking that I haven't seen any other work do is, and I wonder if this was something that just came naturally as you wrote it or you really had to strive to do, which is there's kind of a seamless integration of art aesthetic, art as an aesthetic tool that has meaning versus a history of the development of art. And I never felt like I could easily see yeah. kind of like somebody writing it where half the chapter is on the history and half is on the aesthetics. And this just felt like it was naturally going back and forth and which it makes it so much oh, more pleasurable to read. It didn't feel choppy. It felt seamless. And I never felt like I was losing the artistic side or the history side. And so I'm wondering, you know, was that something you had to really work to do or is that just sort of no, the way that, it- that came very naturally and I think it's because I'm an artist and my 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 uh, frame of reference is is what you know what is the artist doing why are they doing what they're doing and uh in combination my uh experience exploring the history of ideas so it just it was just a natural um, outpouring, for lack of a better term, uh, of the content. Um, um, the big challenge was making sure that um, I was writing well enough. And of course, I credit my editor, Mike Berliner, with, with that. I mean, my I have yet to look at my draft of volume two. I'm almost afraid. I, I think I'll be horrified by it now that I've gone through this experience with Mike. I mean, he's just wonderful. Um, Mike guy. very kindly edited a draft of my first book, Free Market Revolution. I had a very oh. similar experience, which was, it was so helpful. He's so meticulous yeah. and thoughtful. And, right. it, you know, he'll he'll let you know when he doesn't think something's working, but it's very benevolent and, and just yes. but I just remember getting the feedback and having a moment of, oh, there's there's a lot to do here because he spot yes. he, sp- yes. he spotted everything. Yeah. So that was the toughest aspect of it was going from the draft and then through the edits and realizing, oh, my God, this is this is bloody awful. And why did I say that? And, you know, and, and after so many passes we discover something else and, 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 you know, it just, it never ends. I'm still finding typos by the way. It's anyway. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, so that, that was, that was the, the arc for me, the growth was in the actual writing of it and writing it in a way that is helpful to the reader and is not simply indulging my, interests in the subject you know like uh, giving me uh, I mean he gave me uh, one of many things he gave me was fresh eyes uh, on the content and you know when you're writing you know you, it you love the subject and you could just go on forever but you know you you can't burden the read, reader you must keep the reader in mind and an editor a good editor um, uh, reminds you um, and if, if they're a good rational <laughs> editor, they they're they're guiding you in a way that um, you you that enables you to to communicate about your subject uh, in a way that helps the reader and doesn't just simply help you as the writer. Well, I don't know how much you want to say about it, but you did raise it, so I, I am eager for you know the 
complete works. Uh, oh, so <laughs> what's the second? I keep getting Let asked me... about volume two, and I think, well, just read volume one first, and then, and then. I won't make you commit to any kind of timeline, but I am curious as to what period part two will cover. Uh, part two is from the fall of Rome to today, wow. to the early 21st century. And um, it's written, I mean, I've, um, I wrote a draft. Uh, it's just a case of cracking it open and bracing myself and seeing what it is that needs to be done to, to bring it to a, a reader. So. Well, in the meantime, I certainly recommend uh, the first edition, or the first part, uh, Windows on Humanity, to everyone. Like I said, it really was for me sort of the history of art I wish I'd had, and it's it's great if your primary interest is history, and if your primary interest is art, or if like me, you've always been looking to kind of connect them both. And um, I'm I really encourage people to get it. I mean, there is um, there's you know, I'm certainly a novice in this area, but not a complete novice. And there's just so much new. Well, it's written for the novice. I mean, it's, it, um, it's, it's, it's meant for people who know nothing about art history and uh, coming at it from the first time. The, it's, uh, it's aimed at uh, young people as well as adults. I mean, I think the earliest would be senior high school. Uh, you know, if you had a, a cognitively ambitious senior high school student would, would gain uh, value from this. And uh, also uh, adults who want to teach young people, whether they're homeschoolers or teachers, um, I think it, it helps adults educate themselves about art. In, and, and enables them to understand that art isn't this sideshow. It's um, a, a profoundly important aspect of, of life, of human life, of, of a conceptual life. Um, well, and that's, you know, part of an audience that I think this is really good for is even an audience that is not primarily motivated by art as such. But if you're interested in history... Like I, I was so much more after I would read, you know, a different section, I'd be like, oh man, I really want to go, you know, explore like more of the history of Egypt and things. And I felt like, oh, I'm going to bring to it a much richer context, you know, even though we've only spent, you know, 20 pages or something on, on this civilization. Um, but I think the, you know, it, because there is so much of culture and history embedded in the art like that, I think gives you a really good framework, um, even if art is not your primary motivation, but hopefully yes. for people who are interested in history, it'll get them more excited about the art as well. Yes, and, and it, it uh, brings home what, um, what life amounts to in, in other cultures. For instance, with uh, Rome, you can learn that Roman society became more violent, um, and um, you can read that um, life was, the, the Romans were becoming more confused and violent. And uh, you can learn about the various wars that took place and the breakdown of civil society. But when, if you look at the artwork, you can see that the Romans are losing their minds. Uh, they're, um, and you can see this in the relief panels, the, the incoherence of what they're aware of um, uh, is, is remarkable. And that can, that can be very helpful to, under, to um, understand and recall what man went through. And of course, you can learn why did they lose their minds? What was going on uh, in, in, in their intellectual life that was causing that? But the artist shows you the arts show you the upshot. Yes, the Romans were lose, lost their minds. They their world became incoherent to them. They they weren't using reason. Their r rational uh, capacities were sh being shut down. Um, and the art shows that. 
So Sandra, where can people buy the book? Where can they find out more about you and your yes, work? Yes, um, they can they can buy the the paperback version at Amazon, um, and uh, uh, at, uh, at and the special edition uh, of the soft cover and the hard cover is available at windowsonhumanity.com. And the special edition is uh, uh, on, on better quality paper. The images have a little more punch to them and, and the binding uh, is, is a little better uh, than the paperback version. Paperback version is, is lovely, but it's, it's on paperback quality paper. Um, the special edition takes a little more time. Um, these are all uh, print on demand uh, pieces. So even with Amazon, it's, it's print on demand. But, but it takes a little bit more time to get the um, special edition. Well, wonderful. Thanks for taking the time. I, I hope people read the book and look up your work. Uh, Thank the, you for having me. I'm so glad you enjoyed the book that you got it in hand. And Oh, absolutely. And I should just point out to people, I mentioned the bus of Ayn Rand. There's one right behind you Oh yeah. Uh, right now. So you can get a a flavor of it. I think it's on your website as well. So, yes. Uh, but again, it's been wonderful. And thanks so much for taking the time. You be well, you take care.